Hello, and welcome to Sobercast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting Sobercast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Good morning, friends. My name is Puven. I'm an alcoholic. Let me get the lumps out of my throat first. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Uh, to the Limpopo Rally Committee for, for having us here this morning and last night. It's been amazing so far. Thanks, guys. Uh, I just want to say thanks to Michelle for chairing and thanks to my lovely wife, Riz, for sharing her experience, strength, and hope with us. Also, I just want to give her a round of applause because that was a maiden share as well. So, yeah. Well done. Love you. But after l- listening to what she had to say, this is an honest program, and I have to come here and tell you guys the truth. Now. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you know, sp- spoke about miracles, and miracles ultimately come from higher power. And the spirit, you know, for me, if there was no higher power or you know, the, I know Scott told me to, or sent me a SMS to speak on the realm of the spirit is broad. You know, and to, I relate that to my power. And some, just over seven years ago, I didn't believe in that. I, I knew of I, I knew of God. I choose to call my higher power God. I knew of God. I was a religious person from childhood. But the way my life was going, I believed that there was no God in my life. I did the religious stuff, but I didn't have a conscious contact with, with any God because I would do things, say things. My actions didn't, wouldn't lead somebody to believe that I was a God-conscious person. And, you know, the things that were happening, I, I blame God because I would ask myself in the morning, how can this happen? How can I go, go so overboard last night? You know, and I'll, that's the time I'll talk to God at 4 o'clock in the morning when I'm driving home. And I'll say, why didn't he take me home at 6 o'clock like normal people? You know, and yeah, so that's... But today I know different. Today I know that God was always there. I wasn't looking in the right places. You know, the, the kind of God I found in Alcoholics Anonymous, he doesn't go to the local pubs, shibians and taverns. So when I came here, I found the God that I was looking for. And, you know, it's been, it's been amazing. My, the way that my life has turned in the, over the past seven years, it's nothing short of a miracle, like my wife was speaking about. But, yeah, today I can rely on God. I can do or make God-conscious decisions. I'm not perfect. I'm not a saint. But I try. And as long as I'm trying along those lines, I know I'll be okay. You know, life gets more manageable. It's not easier, but it's manage- it's, it's, I'm able to manage it, which is, for me, was step one. My life to- was totally unmanageable before. But today, I can, I can honestly say that it's better. There's a brief history about me and where I come from and what, why I'm standing here today. Is, you know, I started drinking like any other normal teenager, if, that's, if there's such a thing, if you can use normal and teenager in the same sentence. Uh, but yeah, it was purely experimental, you know, a beer now and again, and I enjoyed it. And if we bought a six pack with three or four guys, I would drink four of the beers and they would drink two. But I, you know, I never saw myself as having a problem back at such an early age. But, we know that this is a progressive disease, and for me, that was quite clear, because by the time I was 18, 19, I could, I could drink properly, you know, like an like a adult or like an old man. But I, was, I would say I managed to control it. Not that I was counting how many I was drinking, or, you know, I never take count of those things, but the reason why I could control it I was still living with my parents. 
and drinking legally and we you know we indian we come from the old school we're not allowed to drink wine on the dinner table and whatever so i couldn't drink in front of them and i couldn't go home drunk so that's why that's if i look back that was my way of controlling it but if it was legal at home and if i was allowed to i think it would have been a different story but nonetheless i still drank and got into trouble from an early age you know over the years if i reflect there was nothing good that came out of me drinking all my getting caught for drink okay, i never got caught for drinking and driving but i got i got almost arrested because i was drunk but i was parked on the side of the road so when the police stopped and he said you're, you're already drunk but i said yeah i wasn't driving the car was parked off you know um every time i i landed up in jail or in trouble it was always alcohol related so that's why i say there was nothing good that came out of me drinking but it didn't stop me i didn't know I didn't know that this is what's going to happen. You know, I drank for the fun of it, but at the end and I justified a lot of it. You know, because I was with the wrong friends. It wasn't my fault. I wanted to leave and they told me stay and have one more. But it was my choice. But the minute I if I had to admit and say yes, yes, I know I'm drinking too much and that's my problem, then I'll have to do something about that. But I was too clever. So if it if it wasn't my fault then I don't have to worry you know because I I wasn't ready to stop to give up drinking so it continued like that I moved up to Johannesburg in 1998 99 for a better life because I messed up in Durban so I came up here single alone and I thought I can manage so I came up like I said looking for a better for a second chance when I I found that life because now I had the freedom my parents weren't there anymore I didn't need to answer to anyone I was living with a cousin so now I could I realize I could drink whenever I please go and come as I wished nobody to open the door or smell my breath or you know look at me and say are you drunk now so again the alcoholism progressed you know when I when I listen to speakers I always get amazed somebody can share the most horrific stories then they pause and say and then it progressed how much more do we need you know so the drinking didn't stop it actually got worse but with all this i was i was still managing to work and support myself then i met my wife and after some time we moved in together and for a bit the drinking you know i had to impress her so i managed to control it again and but as we got to know each other on a more intimate level and you know we, there was no secrets then i i started expressing my true self and by then it was not too late but she she knew now and that's when all the lies and the deceit and the dishonesty crept in because i couldn't say that i'm going to drink i had to make an excuse because if i said i'm going to drink she knew for a fact i'm not coming back so if i said i'm just going to help a friend for 20 minutes i'll be back so she they i'll give her some hope that there is a possibility but as soon as i leave the driveway i know i'm going to drink i'm not i'm not saying that i knew i'm not coming back home but i would go and drink and i'll tell the guys you know i need to have an early night tonight but once i have one we know what happens by the fourth fifth one that promise to go home is no longer important and you know we are talking about it on friday night with the guys if i said i'm coming home at 10 o'clock and it's now 11 o'clock and she phoned and she said what's the story and i'll make an excuse i'm coming now and by 11:30 another phone call by 12:30 the phone is off or by 12 o'clock the phone is off and the guys will say but you said you're leaving shortly i say yeah, if i go now i'm still going to be in trouble so i'd rather go at whatever when i'm done and still be in trouble why go why go home early when you're late and still get the, the, the scolding or the scores you know I'd rather make the best of it than it makes the scolding worth it <laughs> so you know and the blackouts most of the i think towards the end of my drinking every time i drank i was i drank in a blackout state 
because those weekends that she spoke about, sometimes even I can't account for those weekends. I know I'll be drinking up until a certain point, and next thing I know it's like Sunday morning and I need to go home. And she'll ask me, where were you? What? And I'll sit quietly because I can't answer those questions. If I answer it, I'll be lying. Only when I meet the friends during the week and they start reminiscing about the weekend, you know, vaguely I put the pieces back together. And with all that, it didn't stop me from even considering that maybe I'm an alcoholic. I didn't know what an alcoholic was. For me, I was just drinking and having fun. Like you heard, my son, she was, my wife was pregnant for my son. I still behaved irresponsibly. Yet I claimed that I'm going to be the best father. When he was born, the day he was born, I got pissed. I was at the hospital in the morning and we went through the birth and everything. But as soon as he was comfortable in the maternity ward, I went down to the, to the mall and I would just drank for the rest of the day. You know, uh, the umpteen promises to give it up, to cut down, to stop, didn't work. I could for a brief, if I didn't drink for a week, from Monday to Friday, I went and drank on Saturday to celebrate that week. You know, that's, that was me. I, I could stop drinking, but I could not stay stopped. And I had to reward myself. If I didn't drink for a month, I had to reward myself by drinking. The insanity. But with all that, I never knew I was an alcoholic. I didn't uh, see myself having alcoholic tendencies. And, you know, it just got worse. Life was unmanageable, totally. And up to a point, at, at the early stages, my justifications were the rent is paid, there's food in the fridge. You know, what's the story? What's the problem? If I want to drink, leave me. But even like towards the end, due to my drinking, I was unemployed. You know, my friends didn't want to drink with me anymore. I was a nuisance to them. My family wrote me off. My father wrote me off. He said, you cannot be my son. I cannot raise, I would have not raised somebody like you. And he disowned me twice. Now, in my, you know, normally if somebody is disowned, they say, right, forgotten. But I managed to win him back only to be disowned again. And now I understand only alcoholics can do that. Normal people will appreciate that second opportunity and, and hold on to it. But I didn't respect that. You know, even with them, umpteen promises, nothing worked. You know, uh, and I did a lot of crazy, stupid things whilst drinking, irresponsible things. Uh, you know, like, like I said, the drinking and driving, the blackout driving. I would drive and the next morning I would ask the guys, hey, I all got home last night. And they'll say, you can't be serious, you dropped me off. And I wouldn't remember the drive. And I'm talking like about an 80 kilometer drive. And God knows. You know, if there was not a God in my life, I don't know, maybe I could have caused an accident. I was never involved in accidents, but I could have killed someone on the road, maybe by causing, you know, causing an accident. I don't know. But thank God that I'm here. Through all that, being at the wrong places, getting involved with the wrong guys. Like I'm, I, I got locked up carrying unlicensed firearm, assaulting a police officer. All those crazy things, and all, all those things were all alcohol-related. But it never made me think. On just over seven years ago, a week or two weeks prior, that fateful Monday morning, Monday night, I left home on a Friday, and I told my wife I'll be back within about two or three hours. I needed to go see someone. And she trusted me because when I left home, I think I was sober, and she trusted me because I said I'll be back shortly. I'm not drinking, I'll be back just now. And I got home Monday night after 8 o'clock from leaving home on Friday. That weekend was a total blur. No one knew where I was. Right? But I was just drinking. I didn't have affairs, I promise. <laughs> because that would, that would take up my drinking time. <laughs> but, you know, uh, it was like I was having an affair. Because I was spending money. I couldn't answer for my whereabouts. I was discreet I was putting my cell phone off. So if somebody didn't know, they would think that this guy is jolling somewhere. And when I came home, there was a note there. You know, if you want to drink, you carry on. I'm taking the baby and I'm going. 
blah, blah, blah. Uh, don't. And that was the first time when I was reading that note, I started, I listened to my wife. But she said there, don't phone me, don't come looking for me. If you're in a drink, continue. So I did just that. I went and showered. I phoned my friends up again. And I was going back drinking. I didn't know where they were. Now, it, you know, it, to me it's fun. It's funny now. But at, at that point, the insanity. I didn't know where my wife and my three-month, three-year, five-month-old child was. But I still chose to go drink. And I drank, I think, it was about seven days or eight days before I found out, found out where they were living. So for that week, I was putting on a front with, with the people that were still joining me, and everything's okay. But inside, I didn't know where they were. That, that house that we lived in was just a shell, you know. And eventually I told her, you come home and let's discuss it. And she said, no, no discussing. you gone, finished, it's over. And I convinced her, okay, you come back home and I'll leave. And she said, okay, fine. But in my mind, I said, as soon as she comes here, I know I can sit down and talk to her and sort things out. But it wasn't the case, you know. And I'm glad because or else I would have managed, I know I would have been able to convince her for that occasion, everything will be okay. But that will just last maybe another month or two, and then we're back to the beginning again. So, you know, my drinking took me to a state where I was sleeping in a parking lot. I still had my vehicle, but I was homeless. I was familyless, jobless, no self-respect, no dignity, no pride. Having a bath was not an option. You know, it was a, if I had a bath, I had a bath. If I didn't have a bath, it was fine. I'll still go out and do what I needed to do. And that on the 25th of October, I was sleeping in the pick and pay shopping center in Madran. And when I got up, sitting in my bucky, there was this empty bottle of vodka, a vodka bottle. And that's what I was, I was drinking over a bottle a day. But it's not relevant how much I drink or what I drink and how often I drink. It's what happens to me when I drink. And recovering from that morning, I'm looking, myself in, uh, looking at myself in that uh, rearview mirror, and I started questioning myself. You know, you're 30 years old. Look at your life. What is wrong? And now I understand I was talking to, to my higher power. And from that point on, I went back to the flat. I packed a suitcase, and I drove down to Durban. And I had a family member that was in Alcoholics Anonymous. And he took me for my first meeting on the 26th of October. And from there, I didn't look back. Something happened in that meeting that that obsession, that desire to drink was removed almost immediately. And then I started working with the big book at 10 days. They just told me, go for meetings. And at this point, I was doing this. I didn't know when I come back whether my family is going to be reconciled. I wasn't doing it initially, initially just to save my family because I had no idea what's going to happen because we were separated. And when I came back to Johannesburg, we spoke, and we decided, let's give it another try. So she took me back, basically. <laughs> uh, but from there on, it was just meetings, meetings, and, you know, meeting uh, alcoholics and learning about what's wrong with me, but more important, learning on how to get better. And getting better is in the big book. And even up till today, I still work with the big book. You know, I don't go uh, into like page this and this is recited word for word, but I, I believe in the big book. That's a miracle to me, that my higher power exists in there. And, you know, life today, like I said earlier, is great. I mean, we're here on a Sunday morning with my family, with my kids, my wife. We could drive up. There was no, oh, you're going to go there and you're going to sit outside and drink the whole night with your friends and I'll be alone with the kids. And, you know, the simple things. You heard about my daughter. That's my miracle. Both my kids are miracles, but my daughter has a very special place for me because if I continue to drink, my wife would have definitely left me and she would have not been born. So that's how special she is for me. Uh, my son is also special because it's because of him I stopped drinking. And it's because now it's because of her that I stayed strong. So both of them hold a special place for me. And, uh, yeah, but, you know, just in a nutshell, 
And today, people can rely on me. And I enjoy that. When somebody phones and says, I need help, and I can be there. Whether it's AA-related or outside, other family and friends. Because that shows me that I'm a useful member in society. You know, I've got a, a responsible job that I open a shop at 7 and I close when we, when we finished. And I'm there. There's no excuses anymore. I'm running late or th- this happened at home. And, you know, I can't make it. Um, I'm living a good life. I'm living a comfortable life. But most importantly, I'm living a manageable life. If something goes wrong, we can sit down. I can look at my options. I look at the book, I look for answers, and I deal with it. I do not need to pick up a drink to deal with my life today. And as long as I keep on doing this one day at a time to the best of my ability, and I trust in my God. You know, uh, I've got a lamp at home. I'm a, I'm a Hindu by religion. And I don't use my lamp as often as I should. I use it when I do my necessary uh, rituals. But I pray in my head. When I'm alone, sitting in traffic, uh, when I've got a few minutes, even at work sometimes, you know, just having that conversation with myself, it's me talking to God. And I understand that today. And for any newcomers that's around, you know, that's how we, you just need to find that connection. And how you do it and where you do it, it's as long as you are comfortable with it. You don't need to go to church or temple every day of the week. Do it within your comfort zone, but make it count. So, yeah, I think uh, my time is up. Eh? So in closing, I just want to say thank you again for having us here t- uh, yesterday and today. It's been awesome. And thank you for giving us this opportunity to share. I am celebrating my seventh Thanksgiving on Wednesday in the Madrid group, which is the 7th of November. If anyone's around, you're more than welcome to join us there. Thank you. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.